8.1 under administrative items. And this is Helen and Catherine. Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council Member. Power. <coughs> an old picture. <laughs> oh, it doesn't have no bridge. No bridge. <clears throat> Great. Uh, we're here tonight because um, we are looking at affordable family housing at 3706 San Pablo Avenue and 1025 West MacArthur. In September of 2010, the City Council directed staff to look at the feasibility of facilitating a development of a 100% affordable family friendly housing project. Um, we. Um, in 2010 and 2011, we purchased two properties um, at uh, 3706 and uh, 1025 with the objective of consolidating both sites to facilitate the redevelopment as affordable family friendly housing. This is, these are the sites, it's the entire site. Um, and you can see that part of the site is in Oakland and part of the site is in Emeryville. This is what it looked like along MacArthur. This was the interior courtyard of um, the buildings. Um, the buildings were demolished due to structural instability, vandalism, graffiti, dumping, and trespassing. Um, on September 4th, 2012, the city approved the RFQ, RFP for redevelopment of the site. We distributed that RFP to 64 affordable housing developers and 18 market rate housing developers. Um, the objective of the RFP was to minimize the city's financial contribution, uh, identify an experienced, competent, competent and capable developer, and to select a project with high quality design, meeting the goals and objectives of the general plan and the housing element, including affordable family friendly, <coughs> friendly housing, activation of the ground floor along San Pablo Ag Avenue, and the creation of environmental environmentally friendly project. Uh, we got nine <coughs> proposals. Um, we had a developer selection process which included staff working with the housing committee to develop some criteria to rank the nine proposals. Uh, staff worked together and ranked those proposals. Um, the housing committee reviewed and approved the ranking and proposed four developers for a short list. Those developers are EAH, Ebaldsi, Link, and Saha. Um, the City Council approved the shortlist in July um, and the City made the shortlist proposals available online and here in the link in City Hall. Um, on August 15th we had a community meeting which was well attended um, and then after the community meeting staff met with the subcommittee of the Housing Committee. We reviewed the community comments from that meeting and what we got online and um, during the, when the, sh the proposals were available. Um, and we set up another ranking system, which was based on the first. Here is the ranking system. Um, we talked, uh, we ranked it based on the quality of the floor plans, the quality of the open space, um, the interior community space and tenant programming, the financing plan, and other outstanding considerations. Uh, when we talked about the quality of the floor plans, we talked about the living space uh, increasing as the number of bedrooms increases. So if you had a larger household, you had more living space. Uh, the number of bathrooms per bedroom and whether there were um, bathtubs available for families. Um, the separation of the private and the public space, um, the provision of private outdoor space, whether it was a distinct dining area, the size of the bedroom, circulation and storage. And this um, graphic here is from our draft um, family friendly guidelines, design guidelines and it's sort <coughs> of an ideal um, 
uh, situation. So I'll take a look at that. We'll, we'll actually see a, do a design that is very similar to that. Um, the quality, when we ranked the quality of the open space, we looked at the sufficient, if, if the open space was sufficient, whether it was placed, where it was placed in relation to other uh, activities on the site, um, uh, spaces for different age groups, um, the variety of open space uses, um, whether there's a, and then in this, we also talked about parking in this um, ranking criteria, whether we were looking for the right balance, not too little parking, not too much parking, um, and we were looking for um, a design that incorporated the safety of the tenants um, in the visitor and the visitors at the site with a eyes on design so that there were eyes on activities um, designed so that people were looking um, at activities and being able to um, for the safety of children but also just um, uh, public safety. And then the other thing we looked at is the sufficient bike parking um, this, and the easy access to the street. This was some um, issues that came out of the public comments. Um, and when we looked at the interior community space and tenant program, we were looking at the types of um, projects, the type of um, programming they would have for the tenants and what kind of space they had for them and also sort of the adjacencies of those spaces so that, um, for instance, um, where the laundry facility might be related next to, uh, you know, a child-friendly outdoor activity or indoor activity. Um, we talked about, uh, uh, and this also came out of the public comment, the spaces for socializing and, you know, what people would see when they walked in and sort of how that would work if you had a friend over, where would you, where would you go with them on the site? And, um, and then I mentioned the location and size of the laundry facilities. Um, we hired a consultant, Seifel, uh, to do the um, financial analysis, their specialists, and um, they looked at the residential development cost, the funding strategy, the operating expenses and the budget, um, residential classroom, and uh, the approach to the commercial, the financial approach to how the commercial would work within the project. Um, this is the scoring of the shortlist um, uh, with those uh, criteria. Um, as you can see, EAH scored 70, Saha scored 66, Annie Baltzi and Link both scored 64. So it was a very tight race. All the proposals were very good. Those, um, those, were, those numbers in that slide are different than what's in the staff report for the scores. The staff report has two sets of scores. They have the original score from the original getting from nine to um, four, and then there's a, later in the staff report we talk about the scores oh. of the short list. So they, um, they are slightly different because we changed the um, weighting of what we did in the criteria. Because once we had the community comments and, and had gone through the short list process, we sort of, some of the things that we got, we used to get from the long list to the short list, we thought we're, well, now, you know, now we're at the these, you know, very substantial proposals and some of the stuff that we used to get there, we took out and we added some points to some of the other criteria that, to weight it more. So this is the, the final of the four. Um, the the sell developer selection proceeded with the subcommittee recommending EAH as their first and Saha as their second choice developers. The uh, Housing Committee approved the subcommittee's recommendation and forwarded the recommendation to the City Council, which is what we're doing here tonight. And staff is recommending that the City Council authorize the City Manager to negotiate an exclusive negotiating agreement with EAH. Um, a little bit about the EAH proposal, and I want to, uh, EAH is here, and they actually have a PowerPoint that they're going to give right after this, so there'll be more um, detailed photographs and uh, of what they are proposing, but it's 86 units. Um, the average unit size is 943, 2.3 bedrooms per unit, which is fairly high, with 7,000 square feet of commercial. And then there's a little bit here about their financing, how they plan to finance it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what made EAH kind of rise above. And in their floor plans, they were designed with ample storage space. And again, I want to talk about how they, the, the, the space increased with the number of people that might live in that unit. Um, the good separation of private and public spaces. Um, units have large bedrooms, and there are four four-bedroom units for families. Um, 
the financing plan was very strong. Uh, they received 23 out of 26 points, um, and it was complete. And the 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 sources of funds that they were using are sources that they have um, received for the most part before. <laughs> Um, we, after we got to the shortlist, we actually had a second set of questions that we asked about their financing, given that there were some changes in the funding that was available. Um, and EIH responded thoroughly um, uh, to those questions. They have a, a self-scoring of 42.3% on their tax credit tiebreaker score, which is competitive. Um, they um, have a fine, uh, their financing capacity appears strong, and um, they, they're consistent. Um, with their finance capacity. Yeah. If you don't mind, can you explain a little bit more what that tiebreaker score is? I I just didn't understand the so, lingo yeah. there. So with tax credits, yeah. when you're doing a competitive uh, tax credit proposals, most proposals meet the sort of a threshold and do um, uh, the things that will get you to propose to um, funding. So then it re you will have to rely on a tiebreaker of all those proposals with through in the region that are eligible for funding and that's how the tiebreaker score is how they decide who gets funded. And would you call 42.3 a high score for that? I just don't know what, how, well, is that out of 100? Is it? It's out of 100. It is no, no, it's more than 100, isn't it? No. You can go up to one. Uh, it's, uh, it might be more It's a percentage, it's 100%, 100 but the, okay. sorry, there's more than 100 points. Yes. But 42.3% a tiebreaker score. Um, I, uh, you can ask EAH okay. a little bit more about this. Um, in the past, we have seen higher scores, mm -hmm. but that's when there was redevelopment, and the you get a great deal of uh, scoring for um, <laughs> subsidy from other sources and leveraging, and so we're not going to see in the future the type of leveraging that we saw under redevelopment. So 40.2.3 does seem fairly high. Which is what I recall from the ambassador and RCD's um, application that we ended up kicking in more to raise their score, as I recall. Yes, and I but think we can't their do that anymore. It's in the 80s. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. I, so it's it's hard to know. Um, there are uh, housing uh, successor agencies that have uh, enforceable obligations that have. So there will uh -huh. there will be some sorting out right. as these projects go through the tax credit um, process. Um, I went ahead and uh, checked references. Um, we got responses for EAH, um, and these are some of the questions. These are not all the questions, but I thought I'd highlight some of the, question, the AMP responses <coughs> about EAH. Um, did the developer ask for additional funds during the pre-development and construction? Well, yes, um, they did, um, but um, as you alluded to before, it was to increase their tiebreaker score. Um, did the developer inform housing staff of changes in timely manner, and did the developer include staff in decisions on the proposed changes, and EAH got very good responses on this question. Did the developer keep the jurisdiction informed of any emerging issues with other financing partners, and again, EAH got a good response on these questions. Um, if you were to work with this developer again, what would you do differently? That question was asked, and um, Nobody had anything substantial to say, <laughs> which is a, is a good response. And on a scale of one to five, with five being the most responsive, how has the developer response? To, how has the developer responded to staff concerns on existing projects? We only got one response on this, but the answer was 4.5. So um, uh, they did well in the reference questions. This is the proposed site plan. I. Um, we're going to go toggle back and forth a little bit because um, this is, was the one place where the subcommittee had substantial um, <laughs> comments. Um, so I am going to uh, go to the next comments. Uh, those comments, the entry to the parking should be on 37th Street. And as you can see in this proposal, right here is where the entrance, the proposed entrance to the residential parking is. And on 37th Street is the proposed uh, commercial parking. So um, uh, because this left-hand turn signal is likely to be um, removed in the star intersection, um, the, and this is a one-way street that doesn't go through, the only way in the future to enter West MacArthur will be by coming up San Pablo and making a right-hand turn. And we didn't think, you know, this number of units um, 
entering, uh, you know, only having one way to enter the site was a good idea. If they were to that, they would be making a U-turn here from San Pablo or perhaps going around the block. So um, we are asking the developer to move the parking to 37th Street, and we don't think that that is going to be too difficult since they already have a parking entrance. It would just be that they're going to have to change that. Um, again, the, uh, the thought was there was too much parking for the development, um, and that um, this community space here, oops, this space, wasn't really big enough for the programming that was in the proposal, and they would like to see more space for activities for the community there. Um, Let's see, the West MacArthur frontage should be activated, possibly by adding townhomes. So that would remove some of this parking by putting that with a proposal to put townhomes along this side. It's a 20 foot, um, 20 foot podium, so you could get two story townhomes in there. And let's see, oh, the diagonal parking, I'll talk about that. Um, and I talked about the community space, and then the only, uh, so this is diagonal parking. This is actually our part of the parcel that we own. Um, so we talked about making that a, a programmed space rather than parking. And the only other comment is around this, what they call the paseo here, and uh, making sure it's designed in a defensible way that it, you know, it's not used in um, ways that are not, positive, um, you know, at night and in the dark, and um, and so um, that design is, uh, we want to look at that more closely. Um, so that's all the design issues that came up out of our um, uh, review. Um, the next steps are to um, negotiate an exclusive negotiating agreement. Um, the negotiating ENA, the exclusive negotiating agreement, is a period where we <laughs> negotiate to prepare a disposition and development agreement. Uh, during the ENA period, we'll get an updated budget and pro forma. Um, we'll get a, a solid number of units and affordability. I mean, as you know, we've, we've asked them maybe to put some more community space or maybe put some townhomes. So those unit numbers might change. Um, they would have to uh, give us a proposed method for financing with application submittal deadlines and anticipated dates of funding for all the other sources of funds that they're going to look to. So we want to sort of get a firmer set sense of where the money's going to come from. They would need to get their land use approvals, including a community meeting. Um, we would want a draft management and operation plan and budget. And we would want to uh, review a draft supportive services and residential services plan during the ENA period. That's it. Would you like to move on to their proposal, or do you want their PowerPoint, or do you <coughs> want to have questions now? Do we have questions from the council? I don't have any questions. Jennifer? I just want to know what's the timeline on the ENA? How long? So normally, um, the, so negotiating the ENA would take two or three months, um, and it will come back to council mm -hmm. um, once we um, have negotiated the ENA, and then there'll be a staff report with that ENA back to council. It'll have to go back to the housing committee first, so that's why it sort of takes a little bit longer. Um, and then the N ENA, because they have to get their approvals and they have to get funding pretty sor sorted out, probably a year. A year? A year, thank you. A year for the NA, it depends. Um, with the ambassador, the NA got uh, amended, I think, three times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll start off with one okay. date and then we'll keep you appraised of what's going on. Yep. All right, let me get the next PowerPoint up. And here's the pretty pictures. Okay. Mm -hmm. you want to come up? And this is Mary Murtaugh. She's executive director of VH. Hi. Hi. Thank you. We're st we're just delighted to be doing working with Emeryville. We love Emeryville. I'm a Berkeley resident, and I come down here and spend lots of taxable dollars with you guys all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just been such a kick to watch the whole city develop and change, and, and you guys have just are just really a shining light in terms of how everything has changed over time. I think it's it's really wonderful. So we're 
ecstatic to be a part of it and really looking forward to, to your to working with you and your staff. Staff have done a fabulous job. It's been a, one of the best RFP, not just because we won, but it has been the cleanest, most transparent RFP process I've worked in, and I think yet. So, high praise. It's um, nice to hear. That is very thank good. You. To hear. Yeah, <laughs> it's it really is uh, was just great. So, uh, just well organized, and we knew exactly what was expected, and it was very fair, very very fair, which is great. So we're. Um, we're delighted. I, I don't know how much you know about us. Have you been inundated with PR about EAH? I mean, we've, we've been around for 45 years. We've built uh, 87 developments, and uh, we actually are active in 50 cities, which I find astounding. Although I've been with the organization 27 years, I'm still shocked at, at how it's grown. But I, I think it's grown for a reason, which is that we're just totally obsessive about trying to do a great job. And that would be inclusive of not only what the city expects, but also the whole neighborhood. Uh, we want to be a credit to the neighborhood and a credit to you. And, and of course, our major goal in life and that of our whole staff is to really improve the lives of the residents. Jack, was it you that asked the question about why rents are so high in all these proposals? Yes, that was. It. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I just wanted to mention that because that is a real concern for us probably also for all the competing nonprofits that were involved. Um, we're, we're all really suffering over what's going on in Washington, and it's very upsetting that um, redevelopment money has been pulled back by the state or just eliminated by the state. So um, the opportunity to create more subsidies to, to lower rents, I mean, you don't do it by building a cheaper building, you build it by having a lower mortgage, basically, and that's how you reach low rents, and Section 8 is being eviscerated as we speak, right. it's just, it's really painful. So I just want to let you know that really is our goal to try to keep rents as low as possible. We don't, we put money back into properties, not take money out. So that's why we're here. So sympathize, but anything you can do to lobby the government, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please help us. <laughs> so we've, we were, are very long and strong on services for the residents and we tailor programs specifically to each <clears throat> building. So we'll be surveying residents as they, um, move in and finding out what specifically would be helpful for them and then trying to work with it, you know, to bring programs in that help them, um, you know, that really are appropriate for the population that we have. So it really depends on who ends up living here, what we'll do, but um, we're, we're known for innovating in the field and creating new programs and doing a great job with that. And one of the things we started a long time ago that's now become like standard issue in the field is doing after school tutoring and computer with computer learning centers and things of that nature. And we did the first one in the Western United States <laughs> uh, in a school district that was about bankrupt at that point. So we were just desperate to try to help those kids. And uh, we started a scholarship program a couple of years ago. We were not the first in the field on that, but we're really thrilled to be able to do that. And we just need a billionaire to give us some money. So if you know any, we'll expand it. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know what else to say, except that uh, we're known for being transparent and honest and um, you know, really trying to work closely with cities and, and not make anything a mystery, demystify anything we can and let you know what you need to know and just be there for you. Um, so our goal is to make sure that you're always happy with this when it's done and you know who to call if you're not. Um, but, you know, that's what our reputation is and uh, that's what we hope to create. So th I'm going to introduce Felix O. Young, who is our senior project manager. He'll give you a few more specifics about the project. Can I ask one question, Mary? Please do. Um, you mentioned that what you do is you survey the folks that are moving in in right. order to decide what kind of service you're going to put into the to the building. How long does it take you to get the service online after you've completed the, the survey? You know, we often work with local nonprofit groups that need to expand their uh -huh. services. So to a certain degree, it's some, sometimes a function of what's available in the community and what we can find because uh -huh. we can't infinitely expand our operating budget. But, you know, as soon as, as, soon as we can do it, basically. Okay. Yeah, but it varies. Okay. It varies a lot. But we can, I could get Diana Ingle over to fill you in on all, <laughs> how we do all our services too. If you're interested, I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Felix. Thanks, Mary. Hi, I'm Felix Alwan. <coughs> I'm a senior ma uh, project manager at EAH, and um, thank you. I'm very excited to be here to present the project. Um, I was 
little bit have, uh, about EAH. And I also want to introduce um, Michael Gold um, from KTGY, the architect for the project. And I think the project speaks for itself and how elegant and um, good looking uh, it is. Um, a little bit of um, details about the projects. I think Ka um, Catherine went through a lot of these. Uh, it's a family project uh, with 86 units. We're proposing a four-story building uh, wood frame over podium. Um, we did focus on the family design and um, fa family friendly design and uh, the Emeryville design guidelines. This will be a LEED certified building and um, I may as well say it publicly here, uh, we want to try to do a passive house certified building as well. Um, it's a, it's a s even higher standard than LEED. Um, Which level of LEED are you going for? We will go for platinum here. Um, and so hopefully, um, I mean, you, I think you shoot for platinum and then, you know, some of it will be budget uh, driven. Right. And uh, if we do achieve the um, passive house standard, I think we, it will not be difficult for us to get to platinum. Um, and um, when we're finished with the building, we um, hand this off to our pro award winning property management company, so which manages more than 9,000 uh, units. Um, in California and Hawaii. Um, so a little bit uh, about the rent matrix, the affordability um, that you mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, the rents uh, will range from $486 to $1,521 for the four bedroom at the 60% AMI. Um, so for a, if you just look at one category, um, in any particular category like the three bedroom units, um, the bedroom, uh, the apartments will range from 30% of the area median income to 60% of the area median income. And for a three bedroom unit, that means that a family that's making about uh, somewhere between $27,840 and $55,680. In terms of the financing, the budget, um, on the left, you see the sources uh, of uh, or the uses of funds. Um, the Emeryville land contribution, uh, we believe, will appraise at about $4 million. The total project cost is about $41 million. Um, and on the right, you'll see the sources of funds um, that w will leverage um, using the $4 million of the land uh, and turn it into a $41 million project. Uh, the majority of which is coming from 9% tax credits. Uh, and uh, answering your question earlier about the tiebreakers, um, currently the TCAC tiebreaker is based on a two-part system. The first part is uh, more heavily weighed, and it has to do with the amount of public subsidy uh, relative to the total development cost. And the second part, which is weighed less, um, uh, less so, uh, has to do with the amount of the requested credit uh, relative to the total development cost. Um, so anytime you have, and TCAC's rationale uh, is to try and spread their tax credits to as many projects as they can. So they want to leverage local funding into the project so they can fund more projects statewide. Um, so, and as Catherine mentioned earlier, and Mary mentioned too, um, the sources of funds are dwindling out there without the redevelopment agency. So. Um, for us, you know, we're fortunate, fortunate that we're competing with other projects in the region. Um, and so um, whatever sources that the, the, the projects that are in the pipeline have, we'll have access to as well. Um, so historically, we've seen the tiebreakers um, trending down. In the first round of 2013, they came in at um, 59 and 60 percent. Uh, in the second round, they were down to 49 and 50 percent, as we see the high, the, the heavily fund, um, subsidized uh, projects clearing the pipeline and the more um, more recent projects entering with uh, less subsidy. Um, we recognize the importance of the star intersection and how uh, this project is really being asked to um, cattle um, to be a catal uh, catalyst for this area and to really revitalize the area um, uh, on the San Pablo corridor. Um, this is the site plan uh, for the project, and I'll come back to this um, this slide and go back and forth a little bit here. Um, so, on the west side of the property is St. Pablo Avenue, and that's where we've proposed a retail paseo. 
um, an arcade um, that is 13 feet inset from our property line. So if you add the 13 feet of sidewalk plus the 13 feet of the recess, you're creating a 26 foot um, public space essentially for um, commercial activities to occur. Um, and it would, it would look something like the pictures that are uh, on top. Um, our own um, community center and community space um, in this current um, design is on the corner of um, MacArthur and San Pablo. Um, and in addressing the, um, uh, the comment from city staff about expanding our community space, we think that we're going to wrap it around MacArthur and take up some of the frontage on MacArthur to activate that area um, and increase our uh, available space. Um, we are actively working with Habitat, which uh, gave us a letter of intent uh, that they're interested in being our partner for the commercial space. Um, they may be the anchor there. Um, they are currently actively looking for another site uh, to move out of their Berkeley uh, location. Um, so we will be meeting with Habitat soon and discuss kind of the needs that they have uh, if they were to move into this building. Okay, back to this site plan. Um, the other part that um, Catherine addressed was the parking. Um, initially, we parked this um, project one-to-one -one for our residents, so there are 86 designated parking spaces, plus 22 guest parking spaces, plus 19 retail parking spaces. Um, and we believe that this was um, a good idea, first to assure that our residents are guaranteed a parking spot and to reduce the parking impact on the neighborhood uh, were this commercial um, activity to be successful. Um, so we uh, will be working with staff to look at realigning our parking so that um, we may be able to reduce it, maybe do some dual use with the commercial and the guest parking um, and thereby um, creating some extra space for us to increase the community area and possibly put some units on the ground level on MacArthur. Um, we also see a lot of the grounds, um, the ground area uh, as potential areas for public art. Um, we'll be working with the Public Art Commission on uh, vetting some ideas. We've got a lot of ideas. Um, some of it can occur in the arcade that's in, you know, that's set back uh, from the sidewalk on San Pablo. Um, that diagonal parking area on the uh, northeast corner. Um, we do have. Uh, we have a verbal conversation with Oakland that they would support that kind of parking, um, but if if we don't want it or if they don't allow it, um, that is an area where we can potentially do a um, type of public art um, rotating uh, sculpture area, or we can do a community garden uh, for the residents. So. Also on the ground level is um, a community garden. Um, this utilizes the space that we have between our neighbors and this property. And it um, allows us not to put our very tall building immediate, ad immediately adjacent to their, uh, to their property. So on the podium level, this is where um, the housing really starts and all of the community activities will start. Um, at the um, right, sorry. So, and, and Catherine covered the um, the concept behind our uh, apartment plans. Um, <coughs> this is almost um, we've done something like this in another project, and it's it's very uh, successful. But um, the public space is consists of the living room, dining room, and kitchen, and it is separated from all of the uh, sleeping areas and the private spaces. Um, on, um, in terms of, sorry, in terms of the amenities, um, on the, uh, in the center of the podium is our family courtyard, which we expect to be the most active area. Um, we are planning to put a playground there and uh, it will have a path of travel where kids can ride their tricycles around and parents can sit and, um, and watch. We'll have eyes in that area. Um, and it is one level, it's the podium level above the street. So it's a, a very safe area for play. Um, there's a, um, a terrace uh, over uh, the commercial area on San Pablo that we expect to be the second uh, most active area. This area is a little bit more isolated or separated from the main area and um, people can overlook the street um, and um, 
it's, it creates, it also creates this um, west opening uh, in the building, which adds interest to the street and also opens up the courtyard for natural ventilation. In the back, on the east side, um, there's a larger area that is more isolated. This is the this is going to be a less active area, um, but it's a more quiet area for people to go to, um, in terms of creating spaces that are different uh, for the residents. And finally, on the roof deck, we'll have a fourth area um, where people can go outside. Um, this probably will be the quietest area, although we would um, we could put programming up there on, on for special events. Um, and this is an area where we probably will expand uh, to create more space for, uh, for community activities, um, but that requires going uh, having a second egress and we'll work with that uh, with our architect. So um, from the street level, this is what you would see once the building is complete. Uh, it's a very high quality finish. Um, it's, it has a lot of um, um, glass and it provides people who walk by a very, very um, comfortable uh, and, and city um, experience. We intend to meet with the housing committee again for our charrette, uh, which we will, uh, to which we will invite uh, both the city council and the planning commission so we can focus on some of the areas that were brought up by staff and the committee uh, so that we can find solutions that would work for everyone. And I am happy to answer any questions you have as well as um, Michael or Mary. Okay. Any questions from council? No, I, I don't have a question. I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, I'm so glad to see Mary here in Emeryville again and EEH. Uh, one of the outstanding things that, that you have in your favor is a track record that's really almost unbeatable because you not only build quality buildings, but the management, uh, the, the ongoing management and the relationship with the, the people you, the, the tenants there uh, just has been outstanding and I I want to commend you I'm glad you're back in town I hope we can arri arrive at a, a good solution here and I'd also like to comment on the process that took place with the housing committee and uh, give some real compliments to Helen and Amber the housing committee because it is really a clear process that is taking place uh, transparent and I'm very proud of uh, the work the staff has done, and I look forward to this project. I, I'd like to echo that, and Catherine as well, for her work. I feel that it was three years ago that you know we talked about having this RFP, and it, um, it's, it seems like such the right thing to do, and I'm glad, even with re redevelopment um, going away, that this still seems possible, so I'm very pleased. I do have some specific questions. I don't want, know if you want to hear from the public first or if I should ask those first. Go ahead and ask. Okay, um, I am um, curious about one thing. When you mentioned the community gardens and having it open to the wider community, I feel that one thing that tends to happen with um, developments that I've seen in town is that often they're gated and closed off; that they are kind of their own entity. And I understand the issues of con or concerns around security, obviously. But I'm curious how you can balance that security and also provide a connection with the wider community. This is somewhat of a unique location because it's not a residential part of Emeryville, but right behind it is a residential part of Oakland. And um, I like how you're um, activating that, but I'm curious about, uh, about your connection, I guess, outside of the um, building itself. I, I think I actually said community garden for the residents, but okay. um, but Not the, for others. the area that is um, let me backtrack here. The area that is the diagonal parking, mm -hmm. um, that that could be an area we could explore in terms of having a whoa, sorry, um, a more public type of um, you know garden um, because it is right next to the 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 houses, the single family houses there are there, um, but that's something that. You know, we can we can discuss if that's something that's desirable for the city or not. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other ways in your other projects that you've completed that engage the broader community, not just the residents of your of your project? Um, 
Let me think about that. I think it's very site specific and project specific. Um, so it depends on, on the property itself. Uh, generally, we kind of keep our space to our own residents. Uh, some of that is actually the tax credit, credit driven. If it's counted in eligible basis within the tax credit guidelines, um, then it actually has to only serve the residents. Um, so we, but we can exclude it from basis um, and then open it up to uh, a broader public. Um, but again, it, it's, it would be driven by the, the local um, municipality if, if that's something that's desirable. <laughs> For it. Uh, on another project, for example, we had a, um, a public pedestrian and bicycle path put in through our project on the edge. Uh, and that's something that where people will go up and it's a kind of a shortcut to their downtown. Uh, so that, that is a public easement uh, that we put in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't get us started on bike yeah. paths <laughs> around here. Yeah, we've had a very hard time getting those in. Um, a second question I have. Um, <clears throat> oh, I just lost my train of thought on that one. Do you want to come back to you? Um, I'll ask a different one then. Um, I'm very interested not only, I'm, I'm very pleased with your um, energy efficiency um, interests on this project, but I'm also interested in how people come and go from the project, in other words, the transportation piece as well. And I'm pleased to see mention of car share um, and the possibility of having that on site. I like the idea of the parking lifts and how you're incorporating that also to reduce the footprint. Um, and you mentioned perhaps looking into a shared parking situation so that the retail <clears throat> and the residential parking might um, actually overlap um, and reduce spots that way. I'm curious and I'd like to challenge you to consider um, including transit passes that this area is very well served um, by transit. It's close, it's, it's just a half mile from BART so it's not um, super close but in terms of 40th and San Pablo is a very active hub for AC Transit and um, there are, are wonderful opportunities there in terms of um, bulk purchase passes and I'd like to see if you could include those. Definitely. Um, I will come back to my other question then when I think of it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? For uh, yeah, uh, Jack, uh, I'd just like to make a comment about uh, expanding uh, and opening up this project to the greater neighborhood. I think we all clearly understand that this is a very transitional neighborhood. And uh, in a development like this, one of your top priorities, one of our top priorities, is that people will feel safe in their homes. We know this is a transitional area. There's a, a number of problems along San Pablo Avenue. So to say at this point in time, we're going to embrace the, the wider neighborhood seems a little foolhardy to me. I think this neighborhood is going to change. It is going to become safer because of the, you know, the increase in population and the, uh, the working population. But at the present time, to start out with the idea that you're going to open this up to a wider neighborhood, I believe you're asking for significant problems and trouble, and you're diminishing the safety of your tenants. Just a comment. Yeah, I wouldn't want to put the safety of the tenants at risk, so I'm just asking a question about that. Oh, I, I want to comment. Uh, 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 Jennifer talked about the, we got uh, started visioning on, uh, for this uh, site three years <coughs> ago, and um, <coughs> this, uh, the city kind of entered some new territory rather than just kind of waiting for the private market to come to us or work out something, but this is the first time that we really put together an explicit RFP about what we were looking for. Uh, there was some concern by some parties about whether people would buy it and then we had nine proposals. <laughs> so uh, I, just, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, and thank you for um, rising to meet the needs that uh, the people of Emeryville have identified as, as being necessary at this point in time. Um, and uh, I think this bodes well for other kinds of explicit RFPs we might put out in the, in, in the future. Um, I, I know your company's done, uh, has a really solid track record. I feel fine. I don't really want to um, uh, talk about the design 
aspects at this point except to say that um, I appreciate your comment about high quality finishes because at least even on the renderings, this sure looks a lot more uh, attractive than many of the projects that have actually been built here. So um, I, I, I think you recognize the transitional uh, and gateway nature of this particular corner and block and um, uh, so often we have a tension between um, uh, trying to do th the, the right thing with urban infill then having it be out of scale to what's next to it and also kind of overdeveloping something uh, beyond what the neighborhood can bring. So um, you have a neighbor nearby across the street in terms of the uh, um, a restaurant use and uh, we went through a lot of discussions about what should go there and we didn't want to ultimately, uh, I, I specifically was kind of um, explicit about not just building something and then hoping for a tenant uh, to take that commercial space. And I would um, encourage you, uh, everything about this is kind of anti-blight and activation and stuff. And the retail space that you're planning for, the one thing I would hate to see is a bunch of empty storefronts on Dante, a bunch of other projects have never really gotten commercial tenants into the spaces that are built on the ground floor. And I, for one, would be um, quite amenable if you can't find tenants for the, com for the retail spaces, if you want to rethink other kinds of uses later on. Um, we're, we're still in, San Pablo is still in the current situation where um, we can't do little uh, small scale mom and pop things on every new project and have them be sustaining. There's still empty spaces a dozen years later after some other housing projects have tried to do that. Adeline Place doesn't have tenants, all this kind of stuff. So um, just to build it and then have empty storefronts creates blight. So the whole, while the whole rest of the project is kind of counter that, let's not put the cart before the horse. So if you need to rethink how you want to use that space, that's fine with me. I want to address a little bit of that. Um, we totally understand this is a transitioning neighborhood and that there are vacancies in the commercial corridor. Um, and we did not underwrite uh, the commercial space into our um, pro forma Great. specifically for that reason. So it gives us and the city the maximum amount of flexibility in terms of whom you want to put into that space, and whether that's some type of nonprofit agency or uh, an arm of the government or some art program or something like that, we, we can explore those options because we're not counting on that rental yeah, income. Yeah, I, I appreciated the kinds of tenants that you sought, and even though they all said that they are not looking to expand at this time, um, uh, I felt like you kind of had your finger on the pulse of the kinds of community-oriented uses that could go in that aren't just strictly commercial retail kinds of uses. So I, I do commend you for, for reaching out to those particular entities. And, and that was my comment, actually, it was about the commercial space. So thank you, Ruth, for <laughs> bringing that up um, and, and appreciating that you could be in a position then, I assume, to charge a, either a very low rent or a subsidized kind of um, rent for an organization that fit with your uh, program and right and in, your in particular um, programs that would benefit our residents too um, so one of habitats um, what habitat brings to the table of course is um, children's program for our uh, kids you know who are residents uh, and also they would be able to get a annual pass from them essentially to use their facilities great yeah. uh, vice mayor can we hear from the public on this yeah let's go ahead any public comment Oh, Excuse Mary. Me, oh, to, yeah. to your comment, to <coughs> reaching out to the community mm -hmm. that, that we were so hoping. Talk closer to the. Oh, mic. I'm so sorry. That we were hoping, in terms of reaching out to the community, that that commercial space could really help be part of that. We are restricted with what we can do within the mm -hmm. formal boundaries of what's funded by tax credits by the statute of the of that. But uh, we've got about 
20 million ideas of things that we would love to do in that commercial space, everything from having really uh, discounted uh, uh, high-tech uh, recording studio available to the general public at a, at a lower price, uh, things to encourage artists and music and, you know, anything that we could do that would, it, so there's just, a, you know, like a, a lot of things that could happen there, so. And Habitat, I think, is also a very outward-looking thing, too. So we really want to help bring up the neighborhood. But I am so sensitive to your comment about vacant commercial space. It's a huge problem. And we really bent over backwards to design the commercial. We grilled several realtors, you know, down to their socks to make sure that we had exactly the right bay width and, you know, fixtures and accessibility and all the rest of that so that we wouldn't end up with a commercial space that wouldn't be attractive. But you know, we're used to, to difficult neighborhoods and we're really, uh, I think for an organization that was founded in Marin County, we work in some of the toughest neighborhoods, which I wouldn't describe this as being anything remotely as bad as a lot of the neighborhoods we work in. So we are all about all the electronic safety and screening of residents and just making sure it's a safe property for everybody's benefit. Because if it ceases to be that. It doesn't benefit anybody, the residents right. or the neighbors. So, so thanks. What, what, what do you think about the likelihood of getting project-based Section 8 vouchers? Right now, very tough. Uh, the, all the housing agencies are being forced to cut back. Um, people have been actually let go. They've, res they've been told they were about to get a voucher and then learned that they couldn't, thanks to the sequester. Uh, so it's miserable. It, it's miserable. Do you have any further information yeah. about that? Oh, it good. is. It is part of our um, our sources of Chief, yeah Miguel. sources yeah. of funds. Um, there is going to be a NOFA, I think, released by the Alameda County okay. um, right. Housing Authority. Somebody so there are some there are some um, project-based <laughs> vouchers available, and we will compete for those. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask one more uh, technical question? Then, when you mentioned if it's included in basis for TCAC, it can't. Uh, count towards others. Is the commercial space then separate from the TCAC? That is correct. Funding. Yes. That's okay. good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now we can hear from the public. Mr. Carpio, go ahead, come forward. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, member of the audience. My name is André Carpio. I live in Emeryville on Ocean Avenue. And <clears throat> this project is new to me. I, it's the first time I heard it. Uh, my first question is, uh, <clears throat> because of the height there, <clears throat> I didn't see any preview uh, to have a suicide barrier there on top. Uh, anybody can jump and four story. I don't think anybody would survive. Uh, second, there is two buildings there, and there is connection between the two buildings. And I was told that uh, because uh, Miss Atkin made an issue about because I had a, uh, some bridge between my house and the neighbor, that I had to take it down because it was a fire hazard, you know. So, um, I mean, I was wondering if she's blind because there is the same thing across the street, and that's not an issue, while mine is an issue, and this is an issue also. Okay, and then next thing here. On the roof, I didn't see any uh, solar panel. I mean, what's going on? Yeah, are we going to save energy or what? Uh, who's going to pump the electricity? And then the third here, yeah, and this is my concern here, yeah, any building that, is <coughs> that has a side ro roadway, like the under side of the MacArthur Boulevard there. I don't see why there could be no entrance in a parking lot, an underground parking from the MacArthur on entrance there. And an exit on 37th Street. Because I see here we have no underground parking and why not? I mean, what, 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 I mean <coughs> We have a large space there, and I mean, is the developer plan to build later on on it? And if we d if he plans to build later on on it, it's too bad. It's already a parking lot. Well, I we could have a parking lot underneath the whole thing, and not only for them, but for other people, because that area is starving for parking. There is business on the other side of MacArthur, on San Pablo here, that does not have any parking available. That's why the stores are empty. You just cannot make business if people cannot stand there. It's simple as that. 
I have more issue, but for now, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Ken? Hello, uh, Ken Bukowski. <clears throat> I think this looks like an excellent project and it's great for the neighborhood and wish you a lot of success. And uh, hopefully you can keep the retail spaces affordable. I think that'll make a big difference. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Anyone else? No? Do you have another I comment? Yeah, I do, sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> All my scattered comments. Um, the, the other thing that I really appreciate staff bringing up is the idea of the townhomes. Um, in terms of podium uh, style, which is what we see again and again and again because it seems to be the most affordable way um, for projects to move forward. I uh, feel how it, it's very important for residents to also feel a connection to the ground and not be just elevated above um, what's happening on the street. And so th both the commercial space um, being at the ground level and then if there was the possibility of having some townhomes or some other connection um, to the street, I, I would welcome that. I feel that um, it's not always good to just put the residents up high and uh, lose that connection. I'd move the resolution. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Get started. Let's okay. roll it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.